Hello everyone and welcome to this presentation on the Flip Lecture, which is being prepared for the 2015 Association for Higher Education Access and Disability Conference at Dublin Castle. My name is Michael Seary and I am a lecturer in chemistry at the Dublin Institute of Technology. Instead of talking to you about Flip Lectures at the conference itself, we thought it would be fun to give you an experience of a Flip Lecture. So let's see how that goes. In this short online lecture, we're going to cover three areas. Firstly, we'll cover briefly what is meant by the flipped lecture, or more correctly, flipped learning. Secondly, I'll give some headline details on my own implementation of flipped lectures. And finally, we will consider what issues might be important if flipped lectures are going to be implemented. This will lead us on to the conference meeting itself, where we can discuss these thoughts more. So what is flipped? I like this diagram from the University of Texas at Austin. It shows that at a simple level, the content delivery element of a lecture is now done before class, just as I'm doing here. Then, the classroom environment itself can become a much more active space, and any issues or problems that emerge can be followed up after class. The BLIP Learning Network has some useful definitions and conceptual information about blipping. They distinguish between the flipped lecture and flipped learning. Briefly, many people will correctly say that they have been flipping lectures for years by providing pre-class reading and so on. Flipped learning extends this further to consider how the classroom and curriculum delivery can become more active and flexible, the nature of the content delivered and the awareness of the educator of sound pedagogical principles. They've described four pillars of flipped learning, and I provided the web link here if you want to follow that up more. Okay, let's move on to my own module. I'm just going to give an overview here to keep it brief, but there's a lot more details in the paper in the link shown. I have a second year undergraduate module in thermodynamics, which I've been teaching for 10 years. For the last two years, I've tried the flipped approach. The rationale for this was that students find this module difficult. There's a lot of mathematical content, which if not understood, becomes this sea of equations that students feel they just have to learn off. Like many topics in chemistry, relating these equations, as well as molecular representations, to the macroscopic world we see around us can be very difficult, as chemists often switch casually between different representations. For these reasons and others, this is a difficult topic, and one I thought would benefit from a different approach. The implementation process was the first mega screencast. I've already shown you some examples. The design is the same as the one here, and at the link shown, I discussed a little bit more about the principles of this design. Secondly, I thought it was important that the students had something to do actively while watching the screencast. They were given an accompanying handout to complete, which also included examples to try and direct references to the associated textbook to follow up. Thirdly, as an incentive and reward for this work, students were given a pre-lecture quiz worth 10% of their module. Previously, this mark had been assigned to an in-class test during the semester. The quiz allowed students to check their progress on the screencast and the questions mimicked the type found in the handout questions and textbook, so it was in their interest to do that work. When the students came into class, they had in-class work to do. These would begin with similar work that in the in when the students came into class they had in class work to do. These would begin with similar work to that in the pre lecture quiz, but gradually build up to more conceptual problems and topics to discuss. Students generally completed this work in groups of three, which is easy to facilitate in a tiered lecture theater. And finally, sometimes some issues continue to cause difficulties. So I would make a quick pen cast going over some of the trickier issues that students could watch afterwards. As a teacher in my own classroom, I noticed a lot of benefits from this approach. One of the great things was that I could look at the quiz answers and quickly see what was being troublesome. I periodically asked the students to say what was difficult and purposefully followed up on this in class. It was important to demonstrate that I was linking the pre-class work with the in-class support too. Secondly, I noticed a much more discursive classroom. Students enjoyed working through the material and I would walk around checking in and occasionally work with the class as a whole at the board. 
Also, as part of the associated evaluation of this project, I conducted a cognitive engagement survey, trying to get a sense of how academically involved the students were. This showed some strong indications that the students were involved in the work that at the moment I surveyed them. What's exciting for me, though, is how can we push this further? In the responses to what students were finding difficult, three categories emerged. I've shown in the table below how I've characterised the category in the left-hand column and a typical student quote in the right-hand column. The first was one where students just saw a lot of equations and didn't know what to do. This kind of student needs to be directed to some worked examples and simple problems so that they can try to establish the basics. The second category is a student who has pinpointed their area of difficulty and ideally will be pointed to problems of increasing difficulty so that they can gain confidence in their understanding of the topic. And the third type of student is someone who has independently worked through their difficulty. This student could be directed to further reading or more difficult or abstract problems. I could go on a lot more, but I want to finish here and outline where we can pick up on this in the conference meeting together. Firstly, we could discuss the potential of this model and any concerns we have. I should say that my own concerns were that students wouldn't show up to lectures and students wouldn't view the materials. In both cases, this didn't happen. It is important to acknowledge my assessment was worth 10% of the module. Secondly, in terms of implementation, how big can the class go? Interestingly, in preparation for this talk, I asked these questions on my blog and got some great replies from educators. You can have a look at these responses by going to michaelseary.com. You'll see here in the comments lots of detailed responses. Feel free to add your own. Also, in discussions with other educators, there is a variance in the form we think that pre-lecture activities should take. As you can see, I'm a big fan of the purpose-made pre-lecture screencast. Do you agree? Should we point students to external videos and existing resources? Just to remind you, I have a blog post on how I designed my screencasts, and you can see it at the link shown. Just note the capital letters in the URL. And finally, from the perspective of the curriculum, are new learning outcomes emerging from this model? And do we need to change our assessment practice, if so? So it's over to you. I'm really excited about discussing these topics with you at the conference. In the meantime, you could have a look at the Flip Learning Network, you could comment on the blog post I mentioned at my website, or you could tweet me at SiriMK before, during and after the meeting. And I really look forward to seeing you there.